our speaker today is Christopher Tassone, uh, who's a staff scientist at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, he joined Slack in 2011 as a postdoctoral fellow to study process structure relationships in organic semiconductors. In 2013, ooh, sorry, I just lost my. 2013, he joined Slack as a staff scientist, uh, where he currently runs a research group focused on combining informatics, in situ measurements, and chemistry to accelerate the discovery and deployment of new materials. And in particular, his work focuses on applications in catalysis, photovoltaics, and additive manufacturing. And hopefully by the end, I will understand what that means. So take it away. Yeah, so um, I, I think I'll preface this by saying, um, given the composition of people, we can kind of take this conversation in, in whatever direction you guys want. Um, so I'm gonna start by giving a little background about what I do, but if people wanna pull in different directions, just to unmute your mic, I'm more than happy to, to make this a conversation rather than a um, lecture, um, for sure. Um, so yeah, don't, don't feel like you gotta sit here silently. I find it very awkward to give, this is probably the hardest transition to Zoom, is giving a talk without an audience um, that is participatory is just super, super weird, um, but uh, we're getting used to it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, a, a really recent push um, by the Department of Energy um, to start to look into how we can upcycle plastics and what that means and then how we're applying some of the methods we developed in other spaces to this particular problem. Um, but first, I want to talk about Slack National Lab. So uh, for those of you who have been on camp, um, if you go on Sand Hill Road back up the hill towards 280, you'll see a sign that says Slack National Accelerator Lab. Uh, so Slack is one of the Department of Energy's 17, um, one of the 17 national labs. And the national labs were created to pursue um, national scientific objectives. Actually, originally were built around uh, developing the uh, atomic bomb um, and atomic energy. Uh, since then, it's kind of been split into two halves. So there is uh, one half of the Department of Energy that focuses on um, the National Nuclear Security and Administration, so maintaining the stockpile, cleaning up nucle nuclear waste, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then the half that I'm in, which is called the Basic Energy Sciences half. So we really work on um, foundational, really close to academic research that has like a 10 to 20 year horizon in terms of making it out into industry. Um, so the stuff that you're gonna be hearing about today is probably a little bit closer to, to making it into the commercial sector. So we're looking at a probably five to seven year horizon for some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so what I do at Slack is use the x-ray facilities that are there. Um, so what Slack was originally built around was a particle collider. So this long linear accelerator that is highlighted in yellow here uh, used to be its main purpose was to accelerate um, particles at the two ends and then smash them together here. And then that's how we figured out uh, the structure of quarks and all of these types of things, uh, subatomic particles. Um, but uh, eventually CERN got built and uh, CERN makes it so that there really isn't any purpose for any other particle collider to exist because it can do this at such high, much higher energies than is possible at any other facility that there's just not really a reason to do that. And so we repurposed both the linear accelerator um, and the synchrotron. So what the synchrotron used to be used for is to speed up those particles and then they'd get dumped into this ring so they could get to the speed of light or within a fraction of it and then smash together. Uh, but now we turn these into x-ray facilities. So if you speed up a particle in a circle, uh, the change in the acceleration by turning emits light. So we have to conserve momentum and that's how it does it. And it emits a lot of x-ray light the way that our uh, facilities are built. Um, and so we use that to look inside of the structure of things. Um, so at SSRL, which is the synchrotron version, um, we have a host of different things we look at all the way from looking at the structure of proteins um, or the atomic structure of metals or other materials that we might make. Um, uh, the, in fact, there's been a lot of work on studying uh, COVID and uh, potential vac vaccines for COVID um, there. Um, all the way to imaging. So something really similar to what you would do when you get a dental x-ray, for example. Uh, the reason why this facility is so special 
is that it's probably uh, 10 orders of magnitude brighter than an x-ray you would get at the hospital, which means we can look at things which are weakly interacting. Um, and uh, LCLS, which is the linear source, what's special about that is instead of essentially having a continuous emission of x-rays, there they pack that same amount of x-rays into a pulse that is 10 femtoseconds wide, which is one times 10 to the negative 15 of a second. Um, and what that lets you do is look at the motion of individual atoms, um, which move at about the speed of sound. So um, a little bit about SSRL, because that is where I spend most of my time. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different techniques that we look at there. So I talked about imaging. Um, that's a lot of stuff that happens on these branches of beamlines. You're going to hear me use the word beamline a lot. I try to avoid jargon, but this is so baked into my day-to-day -day that it's really hard to avoid. When I say beamline, we take a bunch of specific experiments that we build off of the ring, and then we build a whole experimental chamber around it, and that's called a beamline. Um, and so there's a bunch of imaging beamlines. These go from big stuff down to really, really small stuff, so things on the nanoscale, so about a thousand times smaller than the width of your hair. Um, and then we have a bunch of what are called scattering beamlines, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit later. So that's crystallography. Um, and then we have a bunch of absorption beamlines. So if you ever took a chemistry or physics lab and you did uh, uh, UV or visible absorption experiment, this is exactly the same thing as that, except we're looking at absorption of x-rays. Um, and that tells us about the chemical environment of materials and things like that. So why do we do this to study materials and how they work? Um, and the short answer is the canonical premise of material science is that you can, if you understand the structure of a material perfectly, you will know everything about its properties. And so we spend a ton of time trying to understand the structure of different materials. And this might be things like understanding exactly where the atoms are arranged, um, understanding strain, which is from the perfect version of those atoms, if they're moved by a teeny, teeny fraction of an angstrom. Um, we can look at the size of nanoscale objects, what their defect structure looks like, and then um, something uh, that we'll talk about a little bit today is the phase identification and quantity. So usually anything you would a modern material isn't made of just one thing, it's a mixture of things. And the ratio of those components and precisely how they're arranged are really important to how they function. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about X-ray scattering today. Um, and this is the uh, kind of cartoon schematic of how that experiment works. So um, we get X-rays off of the synchrotron ring. Those are focused by a bunch of optics and then hit the sample. And in a scattering measurement, <clears throat> what we're doing is looking at the amount by which your sample scattered the x-rays. And that quantity, the difference between the incident vector and the scattered vector is called Q. So we're gonna see a bunch of plots of I of Q. Um, all you need to know for the purposes of this talk is that the pattern by which things scatter um, is directly related to the structure of the material. Um, and so what I mean by that is we're going to collect kind of arrays of peaks or other weird line shapes that then we build a model of the atomic or nanoscale structure and simulate it and then use a fitting procedure to minimize the difference between the two. And that's how we actually measure the structure of materials. Um, so this is actually a picture of the synchrotron um, from up the hill. Actually, if you were to turn around, you'd see the linear accelerator right behind this picture. Um, and this, these are my group who actually did a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about here today. Um, so as always with science, nothing happens in a vacuum. This is not stuff that I just did uh, by myself. I do sleep and eat and rest. Um, so all of these folks um, were the participants actually at performing this work. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important um, to understand about understanding energy science um, and the development of materials and applications around energy is 
more and more, this is a multidisciplinary collaborative effort. So it's not just um, as it was once, once upon a time where a chemist is sitting in a lab by himself and discovers some new material. Uh, today, we're working with electrical engineers, environmental engineers, computer scientists, economists, chemists, physicists. It takes a whole team of people with deep expertise in a lot of disparate areas working together to actually accomplish the kind of work that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and since we have so many business people on this call or business students on this call, I will make a plug is that one of the things that has, I think, been a traditionally a missed opportunity in science is academics will focus on pretty specific problems that may not actually have a commercial application. Um, and so one of the large pushes that we've been making um, at Slack um, and, and to a large extent at Stanford as well is to do to use techno-economic analysis to guide the research that we're doing so that we're not just performing work which maybe has no end, end use, uh, but rather we know what the benchmarks, for instance, in this case, um, for plastics, how cheaply we need to deconstruct and the plastic. So what is the process cost for that? And then the process cost for the reconstruction that determines what the value add of the final product needs to be. And all of the research that I'm gonna talk about uh, today is guided by that techno-economic analysis, which happened before we ever started the project. Uh, but this is pretty unique. Um, and to take a counter example, for instance, um, I spent a decade working on thin film flexible um, solar panels. Um, and the cost point at which we, needed, we thought we needed to hit to make the solar panels competitive with silicon uh, kept changing year over year. Uh, and the reason for that was no one had done the complete supply chain and capital expenditure analysis for what the uh, factory cost needed to be in order to understand where you were competitive versus silicon. Um, and it turned out after about 15 years of thousands of researchers around the world working on this problem, we recognized that given the theoretical limit of the efficiency of those solar cells, they were unlikely to ever be competitive in the market for silicon. Um, so that's, um, you know, this is always the kind of give and take of science. Doing research for its own ends is absolutely necessary. That's where we get serendipitous discoveries and taking the flexible thin film PV as an example. In that case, um, tons of other uh, commercial applications came out of it. So. Uh, the screen in your cell phone is a great example of that, which uses an OLED, uh, almost certainly, and that is technology uh, that was developed in parallel with the thin film photovoltaic work. Um, okay, so let's talk about plastics for a second um, and why I'm talking to you about this. So plastics um, have fundamentally empowered a number of industries, um, have been wildly successful at changing uh, the, the landscape of the world, how quickly we can manufacture materials, how we package them. Um, when we look at things like 3D printing, they have changed design cycles um, for products because we can prototype things so much more rapidly. Uh, but the problem with plastics is why they are so widely used is that plastics really aren't built to degrade ever. Um, so most polymers that are used in plastics are made so that they will never change their structure. That is the goal because if, for instance, you package something in a plastic, you want it to stay sealed and not degrade in any way. Um, so the problem that that's led to is most plastics are not recycled. Um, and so it's about 16% of plastics that are currently recycled. The way those are recycled is mechanically. So you chew them up, um, and then recast them in a new form. And that degrades the quality of the polymer. So the mechanical performance goes down, for example, um, which means there isn't really a good economic driver for recycling of plastics because you put in a bunch of energy and a bunch of capital and you get out a worse material. Um, and this is a problem that is only going to grow uh, the consumption of plastics by humanity is increasing exponentially. Um, and by 2050, this is going to account for about 20% of our petroleum consumption. Uh, 
So unless we can find a way to reuse or recycle or upcycle plastics, um, we're going to be emitting significantly more greenhouse gases to support our plastics addiction. Um, and in addition to that, because plastics are so robust, they end up in places we don't want them, like the ocean. Um, and so I think um, as much as I would wish otherwise, altruistic drivers for cleaning up these waste streams haven't been working as much as one would hope. Um, and so we need to provide economic incentive to do so. Um, and that's really the mission of this new Department of Energy Consortium. Uh, bottle is its acronym, is to actually <clears throat> upcycle plastic waste. And what that, what that upcycling means is, so in a recycling scheme, you break the plastic down mechanically or chemically, and then you remake exactly the same plastic that you had before. And the issue with that is your process cost is basically fixed by the existing manufacturing cost, right? So it's really hard to realize a return there. Um, in an upcycling scheme, we would take those plastic waste streams and turn them into higher value plastics. Um, um, and alternatively, we can make plastics which are more readily recycled. So we're trying to attack this both on the cost as well as the value side of the spectrum. Um, and I apologize, probably sound like an idiot to the business folks. I'm not a business person. Um, uh, and the way that we're going about doing this is right now, we don't have really good ways of doing this. So f fundamentally, this is a, a, a relatively new problem that people are looking into. There's two ways people have looked at in addition to mechanical recycling to actually um, provide an economic driver for the reuse of plastics. One is burning them. Um, so pyrolysis is the fancy term for that um, to generate power which obviously emits further greenhouse gases, so it's not solving that half of the problem. Um, and the other is chemical recycling, which is generally quite costly. Um, and so we're starting with a known waste stream, um, and we don't know the ways we normally convert chemicals into useful things is the process of catalysis, um, which just means speeding up a reaction that would want to happen anyways. Um, and generally, most industrial processes use either thermal catalysis or in the case of bio-derived materials, biocatalysis. Um, and in this case, since we don't have good ways from a starting perspective of how to convert these materials, we're throwing, we're, we're kind of using a shotgun approach. So guided by those techno-economics, we're looking at every potential pathway to deconstruct and reconstruct these materials and then using the techno-economic analysis to evaluate which are the most promising on an annual cycle, and then downscope and redistribute resources to the areas that are working. So why is a place that uses x-rays to look at the structure of things involved in this problem at all? Um, and the answer is that because we have such a breadth of different ways of understanding structure, we can actually look at the whole process. So from understanding how to synthesize the catalyst more rapidly, we have tools for that, that accelerate the discovery cycle of new materials for catalysis by an order of magnitude. Um, we can characterize the structure of the catalyst, but also the product. Um, so when we're talking about the mechanical behavior of a plastic, um, we actually, that's fundamentally tied to the structure of the plastic. So we can do a really, really short time scale of one second experiment and understand something about what the mechanical performance will be. And so we can decrease the cost and the time investment um, to figure out whether a product stream will be useful or not. Um, and then we can also look at the behavior of the catalyst itself. Um, so for the chemical engineering folks, we do time on stream type studies. So we just look at if we set the catalyst and, this, and the substrates of the plastic in a reactor and just watch what comes off, we can do that. But we can also look at exactly follow the chemical rearrangements that are occurring in real time, as well as the electronic rearrangements. And so we can understand mechanistically what's happening. And we use that knowledge in a process called inverse design. So inverse design, um, since we're trying to drive cost targets down here in this case and energy consumption targets, we might look at for instance, 
an enzymatic approach, which digests plastic and spits out a product that we care about, but might be too costly or not robust on large scales. Um, but we want to make a thermal catalytic pathway for that, um, which is traditionally how petrochemicals are processed. Um, and in that case, we would study the enzymatic approach to understand like these are the key steps in that process. And then we would design a heterogeneous catalyst to mimic those. Um, so really, uh, at Slack, we have a platform to characterize the whole processing pathway, and that's why we're a part of the bottle consortium. Um, so um, I'm going to back up for one second. There are probably 50 active projects occurring across 20 institutions that are all part of this consortium, um, as well as what's occurring in industry. And in uh, you know, 30 minutes, I'm not going to talk about all of them. So I want to talk about one specific problem, which I find to be kind of particularly interesting because it's kind of the crux of what's difficult about deconstructing and reconstructing plastics. Um, so over here on the left-hand side, you have some really common um, po polymers that are used in plastics. So things like polyethylene, polystyrene, um, are, are great examples of really commonly used plastics that you might find in, for example, a Coke bottle that you would buy. Um, and the challenge with this is, so for those of you who have forgotten chemistry, what this chemical formula means is I have a carbon here, a carbon here, they're bound together, and then that repeats ad nauseum. That's what a plastic is, so that's what a polymer is. Um, and so this little squiggly spaghetti line is what that actually looks like in a real material. And then there are just millions and millions of these things packed together to make the solid material that you're looking at. Um, and the tricky part is, if I want to take that, break it down, and make something new, the thing I break it down into needs to be really, really self-similar, in which I don't want to start, if I'm cooking, for example, I'm not going to chop all of my vegetables different sizes because they would all take different times to cook. Right? I want to have everything exactly precisely identical so that I can build a process around how I make that. And in fact, this is why restaurants, majority of the work when you're in a restaurant is um, the prep work that you do, right? Um, and so the challenge here is if all of these bonds look exactly the same, how do I make sure I'm always cutting this one? Um, and so there is an industrial process that is in use today uh, based on a catalyst that has manganese and cobalt in it. And the problem with that process is it's not very precise in terms of what it spits out. So my badly drawn cartoon schematic down here uh, shows what this histogram of the product is trying to show, which is we don't just get one length of carbon chain at the end of it we get a distribution of lengths of carbon. And so we can't then take that and use that as the starting point for making a new plastic very easily. Um, and so the challenge that we have here then is how do we design a catalyst which is only gonna give me, for instance, 12 carbons in a row. So instead of looking like this picture down here, every segment that I cut is gonna be like this one down here. Um, so how, how does my group go about doing this? Um, so for the past seven years, we've been working on developing a set of techniques that combine in situ experimentation, which is a fancy way of saying, we look at an experiment using some probe while we're doing it. So instead of doing an experiment and seeing what happened at the end, we look at it throughout the whole pathway of the experiment occurring. Uh, we then use a series of kind of traditional statistical models as well as machine learning to automate the data analysis so that that happens for us. And that enables us to use machine learning tools to plan the experiments for us and essentially automate the whole scientific method that we're, we're trying to optimize in this case. And we apply this in a number of areas. So things like additive manufacturing, which is 3D printing, um, as I mentioned before, photovoltaics, um, and then catalysts. And the reason why we use, I'm, I'm talking primarily about these examples initially is, these are places where the potential design space is enormous. So there aren't good ways to search it. Uh, if you were to do a kind of traditional design of experiment, uh, it would take you years and years to exhaustively search these. In many cases, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so the, the way, 
that breakthrough discoveries have been made um, is really kind of intuition or serendipity. So either someone stumbles upon the right answer um, or through training, you have a good understanding of what's likely to work and you make good educated guesses. Um, the way that we look at it in this different discovery paradigm um, is to build libraries of materials which we think cover swaths of the space we're trying to search. And so the catalysts that I'm going to be talking about today are based on nanocrystals. So nanocrystals are materials that are really, really great for doing this kind of controlled understanding of why a product distribution emerges from a specific reaction because we can design the structure of the nanocrystals. We can change its shape uh, quite a bit. We can change its composition, uh, either going from things that are well mixed, which is the interior of this, or things which have like a core shell or a decorated motif, um, or even out to hollow things. Um, and so this provides a platform where we can build libraries of these materials. And what we do with that, so here's an example uh, where we were looking at methane reforming uh, over water. Um, and we wanted to understand to, well, in this case, what we wanted to do was achieve 100% selectivity. Um, and, and to do that, we looked at a series of nanocrystals where we changed the size of the nanocrystals from seven nanometers, so that's this top picture. Uh, so these are electron micrographs of the nanocrystals down to two nanometers, which is this bottom picture. And then we study the product distribution as a function of the nanocrystal size. And we see that in this case, the largest nanocrystals gave us a really uniform product distribution over a range of temperatures, which is what we want to see. Um, so I, I want to pause for a second because this is really core to everything else that I'm going to talk about from here on out, which is this idea that when we precisely control a material structure, we can then study its performance and we understand the linkage between those two. And that lets us design better materials in the future. Um, okay, so um, we're gonna break this problem down a little bit more. So actually the slow step in that whole process, it's not studying the performance, it's making the things really precisely. Um, and the reason why this is hard is the way that, um, and I'm uh, happy to hear that none of you guys will suffer this fate, um, but the way that uh, chemists and chemical engineers uh, design these materials is you go through a long process of synthesizing things, then you separate out the product that you wanted to make, and then you usually look at it using electron microscopy. You figure out, did I make the thing I wanted to make? Most of the time, the answer is no. And you start back over at the beginning. If you did make the thing you wanted to make, you build up the actual catalyst, which is supported on some porous material, and then you characterize the reactivity and selectivity. But the slow step in this process when we started uh, was this figuring out how to make the materials that you want to make, the specific catalysts. Um, and when I say slow, I mean, sorry, this is an example of one of these libraries of catalysts. So this is a series of palladium materials um, where we varied the size in kind of one nanometer increments. Uh, with really narrow distribution in that sizes. So all of the catalysts in the two and a half nanometer example are the same within a single extra layer of atoms, which might be different between one or the other. Um, and this was about a year of work for a grad student to figure this out, how to make all of these materials. Um, and so when we're looking at like, where's the opportunity in the space, the opportunity then becomes, if I can take that year and compress it down into a day, how much does that enable me to accelerate my research um, outcomes? And quite significant. Um, but how do we actually do that, right? It's an easy thing to say like, okay, let's just make this go faster. Uh, but you know, these are not um, unintelligent people trying to figure this out. It's not just one person's effort. It's a group of graduate students at Stanford. Since you guys are all attending Stanford Graduate School, I'd hazard a guess that you think they're probably quasi-intelligent folks that are doing this. Um, and so the answer isn't just work harder, get smarter, do anything like that. We need a fundamental paradigm shift in the way that we're doing this. Um, and for us, that paradigm shift really was enabled um, by machine learning. So machine learning tools are just really robust right now. You don't have to have a background in computer science to use them. Um, 
it's they are at that level that building web products was maybe 10 years ago, where you no longer needed to be kind of a CS jock to build an amazing web tool. There were tools available that let the novice build them. Um, and as scientists, we started to pick up and get our hands into some of these tools and figure out how can we combine the thing we've been doing for a long time, which is this kind of in situ monitoring um, with some of these more modern data science approaches approaches to speed up the way at which we do things. Um, and we tend to call this a data-driven approach. Um, it's kind of a silly moniker because all science is technically data-driven. Um, but what we really mean by that is when you're thinking about an algorithmic approach, right? The first thing that you need to do is say, what are the inputs that I'm looking at? And then what is the output of the algorithm? So in this case, we were trying to figure out how can I make a library of materials which I want to vary the size. Um, and so the inputs into that are all of the chemistry that can occur, right? Which reagents I'm going to use. So what chemicals am I going to put in my flask? How long am I going to let it sit at? What temperature? Um, and you end up with a, a, a space that's like six to 10 dimensions, right? Um, and for the most part, we all across the world do the same things because the way we learn from each other is to read each other's papers. So one group publishes a paper that says, this is how I made this thing. And then some other group's gonna pick that up and tweak it just a little bit. And so we end up being in like these really narrow search spaces uh, for this input space. Uh, so that's, I think the input space part, the desired measurable in our case, we're talking about the size um, and the composition of the nanocrystals. Um, and so the key to using an algorithmic kind of machine learning approach is I got to understand my input output space. So for us, the input space is what are all the chemicals and their concentrations and the time of the reaction. And the output is what did I make? What was its size? What was it made of? Um, and then I need to understand a little bit about how would I measure those things. So I just wanted to populate this table a little bit. Um, so we're trying to make the thing in the middle. This is what I can play with. So this is what I would allow my machine to vary. Um, and then these are the things I need to understand about what I made. Um, and there's a bunch of ways I could look at that. So I could look at that using spectroscopy. I could use electron microscopy. Uh, I can use some of the x-ray methods that I talked about before. Um, and then I'm gonna choose which of these techniques I'm gonna use based on the timescales that these things occur on. So in our case, we're talking about timescales that are on the order of seconds. And that lets us narrow which techniques we can use really quickly. Um, and it turns out the only thing that works for this particular problem is x-ray scattering. Um, so when we're talking about a machine learning loop, we wanna, the machine to specify some amount of inputs. Then we wanna measure what the output is. And then the machine is gonna incorporate that new information, retrain itself and spit out a new set of inputs. Um, and so I need to be able to characterize the output in real time. And that's why we're gonna end up using x-ray scattering here. So the x-ray scattering measurement that we, uh, we are using here is gonna be small angle x-ray scattering. It just tells me about the size of the materials. Uh, if anybody has done any chemistry a, to synthesize nanoparticles, this is basically just a little mini round bottom flask that we made small enough to fit in our beam line. And then we detect the magnitude by which we scatter the x-rays using a couple of detectors out here. Um, there we go. Um, and the reason why we're using scattering is it's really sensitive to the shape. So this is what the scattering curve looks like for a sphere, a hollow sphere, a cylinder, or a disc. And it's also sensitive to the size. So this is how the shift in the pattern occurs as you go from a two nanometer particle out to a 10 nanometer particle in blue. And then lastly, how homogeneous or how self-similar our product is, is the other thing that it's sensitive to. So this local minima decreases as your thing gets essentially worse and worse. Um, the problem with this is this is really difficult to analyze uh, this data. So in the historically, it's taken a person like me who spent most of a PhD trying to understand how the stuff works and then put it into practice for a few years. So for someone like me at this point, I could look at this curve and tell you what the size of the particle is probably without doing any fitting. Um, but for a first year graduate student, that's gonna be a process that probably takes them three or four weeks. 
to understand how to do the fitting and all of that. Uh, and the approach that we take is to try to figure out how we automate the whole process. Um, so this is actually the data analysis flow that we go through here. There's a bunch of data cleanup. Um, and then there's a fitting procedure to actually get you the information that you care about. Um, and sorry, uh, we went about doing that by taking all of the data that I had collected over about 10 years. We trained a set of machine learning mo mod sorry, machine learning algorithms. Uh, well, actually, so first we took this curve and we um, broke it down into a simple set of metrics which we think describe the curve. Uh, so instead of this being an array of a thousand points, uh, we can turn it into an array of 20 points. And so that lets us speed up the training process to something reasonable. It also is really helpful because um, typically the problem with using machine learning in science is we don't have big data sets. Um, so if you're talking about an experimental scientist, if I have 200 or 300 data points of different materials, that is a huge data set for me. So it's not a, a problem like Google might have where I have 100,000 or a million different pictures of dogs and cats. And so it's easy for me to train a machine vision algorithm to recognize those. I need to simplify the problem. And one of the ways I can simplify the problem is turn a big old array like this into a few descriptors. And then I train an algorithm to just understand the correlation between these descriptors and the output that I care about, which is the size. Uh, so this was a project that took about two years um, and three uh, material scientists turned data scientists to, to code up. Um, and it works reasonably well. And the way it works is essentially it looks at any new data that you have coming in. We've broken the data down into sets of system classifiers. So first there's a classification layer. And then once you have the classification layer, it goes down a different the size or the shape. So it essentially looks says, is this nanoparticle a sphere or is it a cube? Is it a mixture of sphere and cubes? And then once you know that, then it can send it down a different, different pipe uh, to figure out the size of, of those different materials. Um, so sorry, this is just a, an example of the interface. Uh, one thing I will say, scientists aren't necessarily code the prettiest software that you've ever seen. We're pretty utilitarian in, in nature. Um, but the important point here is that uh, this can handle, I think the trick about using these kind of feedback loops in science is your analysis needs to be nearly perfect. So when you're trying to feed a machine to design experiments for you, if your analysis tool fed it the wrong answer, you're just making your algorithm stupider and stupider instead of smarter and smarter, which is what you wanted to do with every experiment. Ah, more examples. Um, so with just, so I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about acceleration here. So with just doing that step of automating the data analysis. So now instead of it taking days for a graduate student or a postdoc to interpret the data, it now takes seconds. We're able to take a recipe like this, um, which made a mixture of things. So these are little nanowires um, and little nanospheres. Um, and there's actually some nano cubes in there if you care to look. So it's a mixture of things. That mixture is, is useful for nothing. Um, but if we can make just the nanowires of this iron platinum material, it's a really useful catalyst for what goes in your catalytic converter in your car. Um, so it's useful from an economic pers perspective because we're using less platinum, which is the thing that's in your catalytic converter right now. Um, and it's useful from an environmental perspective because it converts the noxious chemicals you don't want to breathe uh, at a higher selectivity. Um, and we can take this recipe, which we had been working on for three months, and in a day of looking at different combinations, um, break it down into act the actual products that we want. Um, so this, this was the first step at accelerating that, uh, but this really only lets us look at, we're still in that normal feedback loop where we're relying on the chemical intuition of the scientists. The second piece um, is actually training a set of sequential learning algorithms uh, to do the design of experiment for us. So this is the basic loop in a sequential learning approach. Um, and so um, how I will differentiate sequential learning, and if there are any people who care to educate me, I am a lifelong learner by nature of being a scientist, so please correct me if I am wrong here, um, is 
that you are using a machine learning framework for which you are retraining the algorithm at each sub subsequent step where you have new data to introduce into it. So in our case, our approach to using this was we built a machine controllable set of reactors. So we can, everything can be controlled by machine. You don't need any humans in the loop. Computer send synthesis conditions to that reactor. We measure what we got out um, using the scattering methods we talked about. The automated data analysis pipeline figures out what we made. And then we package that together with the synthesis conditions and feed it to a machine learning algorithm, which then trains on all of the information it has so far of what were the synthesis conditions and what do I make? Um, in this case, we used a, a random forest architecture for those who care. Um, this also works with several other flavors um, that we've looked at as well. Um, and, and what this basically does is you start with an algorithm which knows nothing, right? It, it doesn't understand that it has no data by which to correlate. And you just start running experiments. And as you do that, the algorithm starts to learn. When I tweak this parameter this way, I got this size. And as I tweak this parameter that way, it starts, I got this size. Um, oh, sorry. This is what all the chemical pumps and stuff look like, but since we don't have any, any people. Um, and so what the algorithm is essentially learning is the correlation between this set of in inputs, which we talked about, um, and the outputs uh, on the other side, which was the size and the polydispersity. Um, and when we do that, uh, the amazing thing is actually it doesn't require big data. Um, so it turns out that maybe uh, chemists <laughs> aren't so good at figuring these things out. We just had relatively easy problems to work on so far uh, because our sequential learning algorithms can start with a data set of 18 experiments. So we decided on 18 different experiments that we coded up. That was the training set. Um, train the initial algorithm. And then we let it run. And we were trying to target a nanocrystal with a radius of 30 angstroms. Um, our other condition was to maximize the yield, which is this intensity here, and then to minimize uh, the polydispersity in the system. Um, and after an additional 28 experiments, we hit the target. Um, and so I think this is exciting for us from a number of perspectives reasons. First, this is the first example of kind of a completely closed loop autonomous pathway to discovering new materials. Um, the only other places these have been widely used is in drug discovery. Um, and in those cases, they got to start quite a bit earlier because they do have data sets of hundreds of thousands of different pharmaceuticals. Um, and so five or six years ago, when Google released um, the tools that they released. Um, okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, they could just start using them. Whereas we had to build tools that worked for our small data sets. Um, then going back to that. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this, and I apologize, I should have replaced this with a, a better figure, is the machine isn't doing searches the way a human does searches. Um, in other words, it's not varying, like keeping everything else constant and then varying one of the parameters at a time. It's going crazy. <laughs> So it's changing a whole bunch of things non-linearly from experiment to experiment. So what this plot actually is, is showing you the different concentrations of the different reagents, how it's changing the overall flow rate, um, and how it's changing the temperature, um, and then what the particles that you get out at are. Um, and why this is so useful is so that when we go back and try to understand what the quote unquote design rules are for the system, now we have a set of data which lets a human figure out, oh, this was the chemical property we were ch changing that led to this different size here. Um, so sorry, all of that to say, how am I tying this back to bottle? So what we're doing now is, yes, we're using that automated tool. So, so the, the punchline of that all is, we took that year long search and we can distill it down to 24 hours now. Um, so that's uh, fairly exciting. It's not grad student's favorite thing to do in the world anyways. Um, but what's probably more exciting is we take that base architecture and we start to include all of the other information we collect about the catalyst. So how did it perform under this reaction condition? And now we have a pathway not only to speed up how fast we can make these materials, but figuring out what we should be making uh, for industrial applications. And then tying this all together into a single platform, which lets us do things like figure out really quickly how to use plastics in our supply chain. Or alternatively, 
um, as the petrochemical feedstock landscape is changing really, really rapidly, it's way better to use natural gas to synthesize things than crude oil just from a cost perspective right now. Uh, but we can't make that switch. Uh, our normal time scale for something like that is 20 years and we need it to be a year. Um, and so these are the kind of pathways of research that let us get there. So um, if people have questions, I'll shut up now. Sorry, Sarah. Oh, it's quite all right. Uh, I just, uh, I'm under an obligation to get folks uh, back into the main room in about four or five minutes. So uh, yeah, we got time for a question or two, depending on how complex they are. Chris, thanks for the, uh, the talk. I actually was working in the petrochemical industry uh, before school. So this is all very interesting because it's obviously top of mind as um, all companies are trying to transition to plastics um, and also figuring out how to deal with the waste uh, issues. So obviously, my mind is more geared towards the applications and whatnot. So uh, really interesting to see how you guys were kind of optimizing the structure of your, your catalysts. But do you, did you, um, I think you, you touched on it very briefly in terms of the selectivity of the, I guess, end um, hydrocarbons that come out. Do, mm -hmm. do you have any more, I guess, um, results on that? Like what kind of compounds you're, you're creating with these catalysts? Yeah, so um, I can answer that in short. So all of the work that I showed you actually came from a project that was looking at converting propane to propene, which is the first step in making, making um, propylene, right? Which is the second most widely used polymer in the world, or third, somewhere around there. Um, and with the plastic deconstruction, that's actually just kicking off this October, um, but we're using these methods there. So in terms of how um, how we can break down plastics to uniform distributions. That's all work that should be coming in the next year, I would say. Um, but these are the methods that we'll be using to do them. So in that case of propane to, to propylene, um, we're able to achieve 100% selectivity with zero degradation in the catalyst. Um, so I think the important thing for that reaction is actually extending the lifetime of the catalyst to drive the cost down. Um, with achieving high selectivity so that the separation costs go down as well. So it's kind of the selectivity lifetime product is the important metric there. Um, and, and there we actually were able to find a platinum tin catalyst that does that with as long as we measured it, which was a week, had no degradation in the activity or selectivity. Um, so uh, what's interesting about that is that's a a reaction that's been looked at for 30 years by various petrochemical companies, billions and billions of R&D dollars invested in it, um, that we're able to see something relatively novel. And actually that's, that work was kind of tech transferred out to industrial partners because we don't have reactors to run under real conditions. So, yeah. Great. Well, I'm afraid uh, I have to cut us off there, but uh, Chris, thank you so much for dialing in from your, uh, wilds of uh, Wyoming and uh, we appreciate you uh, sharing your expertise with us. I'm sure if people have uh, further questions, uh, they're welcome to get in touch afterward. And